Let's get some more analysis and we can speak now to Professor Helen Duffy, an international legal representative of uh, the Guantanamo detainee Abu Zabaida. Uh, you also run Human Rights in Practice. That's a legal practice based in The Hague. Um, let's start by talking about uh, Abu Zabaida. He was detained by the CIA uh, 20 years ago in Pakistan. Uh, he's dubbed one of the pr forever prisoners, uh, someone who's been there a, a very long time, from pretty much the beginning of the facility, detained without charge or trial. Uh, do you expect him to be freed anytime soon? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. What I can say, of course, is that he should be freed immediately because he's uh, been held, as you said, without any charge or trial. He's never even had the lawfulness of that detention reviewed by a court of law. So in, in many ways, his case really epitomises the arbitrariness that is Guantanamo Bay and still is Guantanamo Bay today. Um, whether or not he will uh, be released uh, is, of course, a, different, a difficult political question. There's absolutely no legal basis, no moral basis uh, for his continuing detention at Guantanamo Bay. But according to US Justice Department documentation, and I can quote them uh, in saying he was an associate and a longtime terrorist ally of Osama bin Laden. Um, is that true? And if it is, we're not talking about someone who's uh, entirely innocent, are we? Well, I mean, first of all, there's a presumption of innocence, right? In any state that operates under the rule of law, people are presumed innocent until they're proved guilty. Um, and when you prove guilty, you prove guilty of uh, having committed specific crimes on the basis of evidence that you then have the opportunity to refute. So in this case, um, there is no presumption of innocence. There's a presumption of guilt on the one hand. Uh, secondly, a lot of things have been said about Abu Zubaydah. Um, when he was captured, it was said publicly he was the number three in Al-Qaeda. Once he got access to a lawyer, that the allegation that he was even a member of Al-Qaeda disappeared. So we really cannot believe, I think, a lot of the things uh, that are spread um, about Abu Zubaydah. What you need to have is some kind of process where any evidence, and we have to doubt whether there is any evidence 20 years later, but any evidence against him can be brought before a court of law uh, and he can defend himself. Uh, and any evidence that there is, presumably some of it was obtained under, under, under torture, wasn't it? Well... Again, if, if there is any evidence of criminality, I mean, that's what we simply have not seen. I mean, I, you know, we've seen allegations, we've seen many sort of, uh, many things, many much speculation uh, on the internet about what Abu Zubaydah might think or who he might be associated with. Um, what we, we, what is relevant, of course, is whether or not he committed any crimes and there's evidence of that. And that's what we've seen, absolutely nothing to suggest that. So there really is no basis for his detention um, at this point whatsoever. And just talking about the treatment he's undergone, I mean, according to reports I read, and you can verify for us, perhaps he, he lost an eye uh, and also underwent waterboarding uh, more than 80 times in, in the space of a month. And I'm just wondering, uh, what sort of a psychological state is he in, actually? Well, there's a great difficulty around his case, which is that everything um, that Abu Zubaydah says uh, and uh, facts related to Abu Zubaydah are presumptively classified. He lives still in this kind of black hole where he's unable to communicate with the outside world. So there are also limits as to what I can find out about Abu Zubaydah's state directly and what I can say about it. Um, what is a matter of public record is that in a sense, he epitomized this horrendous CIA-led torture program, but he was subject to the most egregious forms of torture. Um, and it has been said that, of course, that's had um, a serious physical and psychological uh, impact on him. Um, that goes without saying. Um, and of course, as a torture victim, as well as as a victim of arbitrary detention for a staggering 20 years, um, he's entitled to rehabilitation. He's entitled to the sort of, not only to be released, but to have the sort of rehabilitation and support that's due to torture victims. But of course, he doesn't have that support in Guantanamo, and there seems to be no effort uh, to release him and to provide him with that kind of support. Uh, and the United States obviously didn't act alone with that rendition program that you were just mentioning it. Uh, uh, you know, your client was held at a facility in uh, Lithuania, we understand, and subsequently in Afghanistan. Given these different geographical locations, where does the culpability rest? Does it, uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the torture and the illegal detention, does it rest with the United States or does it rest with those host countries? Well, that's a, a very good question. I mean, I know in your introduction, it was pointed out quite rightly that this is a real stain uh, on the United States. 
But it's much broader than that. This is an international disgrace um, because responsibility is very much shared by a whole host of different states that contributed directly to his unlawful detention um, and torture in these CIA secret sites around the world, um, which ultimately led to his transfer to Guantanamo. So what we've been trying to do in legal action is to say that the states that share responsibility uh, for that torture and unlawful detention also share responsibility for trying to bring the ongoing violations of his rights in Guantanamo Bay to an end. So states really need to step up um, and they need to assume that responsibility and do everything within their power to bring those wrongs to an end. Can I also just say you mentioned Lithuania and of course there's been a, a, a judgment at the European Court against of Human Rights against Lithuania and against Poland. Um, and Lithuania has recently paid compensation to Abu Zubaydah, but many other states were involved, uh, not only in allowing their territory to be used for his secret detention and for him to be transferred to Guantanamo, but also, for example, the United Kingdom, uh, providing questions to be posed to Zubaydah, despite the fact that they knew he was being tortured at the time. So this is, responsibility uh, goes far and wide, and it's time for states to acknowledge that, to seriously investigate, and to step up and try to bring this to an end. Yeah, and that sort of adds to the layers of, of, of complication, clearly, to uh, sort of drawing, uh, uh, reaching a conclusion with, uh, with, with all of this legal documentation, I've no doubt. I, I mean, do you hold out hope and do you think that that payment of reparations by Lithu Lithuania sets a legal precedent, for example, for other people who've perhaps been wrongly accused, uh, subjected to torture, and indeed for the relatives of people who are no longer alive because a number of uh, detainees have, have committed suicide there at Guantanamo? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to be hopeful um, and we have to keep fighting. So I don't think we can only be hopeful. I think we have to be determined to convert that hope into a reality. Um, I think the picture is bleak, um, not only in terms of the 39 men who remain in Guantanamo, um, many of whom have had no due process, as we've said, uh, whatsoever, um, but for, for many others. At the same time, there has been recognition, there have been judgments recognising the wrongfulness of this, and we are still moving in a direction uh, where states are slowly uh, acknowledging, beginning to apologise in very few cases. We need to see much more of that. We need to see real concerted investigations and accountability so that this doesn't happen again, and also so that individuals and their families can be recognised and given the support that they need. And just lastly, I mean, 20 years on, the facility at Guantanamo is still open. There don't seem to be, or perhaps you know differently, any signs of progress with regards to closing it. Why not? What's stopping? What's, what's holding that back? That's a very difficult question for me to answer. And it's, it's really, um, obviously, what is clear is that there is a lack of real political will to do that. I mean, as you know, you've already noted, several administrations um, have expressed their desire to, their commitment to close Guantanamo, but there just hasn't been sufficient political will. It's a very toxic political environment. Many factors feed into that in terms of fear, in terms of misinformation about who these people are. I mean, our client epitomises that again, but there are many others. Uh, we saw it recently in the US Senate debate where um, you know, simple misinformation is put out there as to these people being the so-called worst of the worst, as has been said about them, where that simply isn't the case. There is no evidence to support that. So I think this inflames um, an irrational fear. Um, there's no security reason to keep Guantanamo Bay open. I mean, it's now quite well established that actually undermines American security. You know, I've heard that from many people in human rights work around the world, that it's used as a so-called recruitment tool. Uh, for ex violent extremist organisations and that it undermines the rule of law, it undermines efforts to hold other states to account when they engage in this kind of unlawful activity. It doesn't make any uh, sense from a security point of view, um, but it's a toxic political environment and uh, I think all actors really need to, to bring whatever weight they have to bear uh, to try to make it a political priority for many within the United States, but also internationally. Um, and to try to really uh, bring this to an end once and for all, because it's it's there's a lot at stake. It's a powerful negative symbol um, that some states are above the law, that some people are below the law. And I don't think that we can afford to pay the price of that negative symbol continuing in force and that impunity continuing into the future. OK, well, thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, Professor Helen Duffy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much.